What's good, YouTube? You know what it is. OTB Gale yeah, back in the cut. You know what's up. Back with another banger. Dream Team Documentary Part 2. It's only two parts. I did Part 1 today. And now I'm doing Part 2. If you made it to Part 2, I appreciate it. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe. I'm not going to spend too much time. What I do know is... If it wasn't for Magic and Larry, there would be no Dream Team, bro. This 1992 Dream Team, there would be none of that if it wasn't for Magic and Larry is what I'm looking at in my eyes. They wanted to play because Magic and Larry is playing. People still wanted to be a part of it because Magic and Larry. So let's see, man. Let's get into it. After a few days in Monte Carlo, the players returned to the court for an exhibition against the French national team. You know, everybody had their eyes on one team. You could feel it. It was just such talent and such incredible skill, and it was just such a pleasure to watch. The Americans won the game easily, even if their performance was far short of seamless. What a great game. A lot of sloppy pass and I didn't like any of it. That was a terrible game, and U.S. looked half interested. And so Chuck, kind of the next morning in Monte Carlo, even though everybody was a little hungover and tired, had to really kick their butt. Chuck says, okay, this is what's going to happen. We're going to play it like a real game. We're going to play four quarters. We had me, Scotty, Mullins, Bird, and Patrick, and Magic had his five. We weren't going to change that team at no point in time. You got your five, I got my five. We gave them the college guy. You can have Christian Leitner. We don't want him. You can have him. He's just over there waiting to tag in. But it was it was about, about pride. And the college kid couldn't help either one of the teams. Right. Michael Not seen the flow. Applied out and went at him. Tell him, this is what I'm going to do to you. Fall away jumper. Good. What did I tell you? So I said, no, Clyde, you better get him back. You better get him back. Okay, Clyde. Charles Barkley said, I want to take Carl Malone now. So Charles gets it, all the way jumper, good. I said, oh, no, Carl, you got to get him back. You better go down there and get him back. Carl went right at him, jump shot. You ain't nothing. You ain't nothing, Barkley. So then I came down. <laughs> real high. He feels like he's in an opportunity to prove himself. Oh. Showcase that, hey, look, I'm still Magic Johnson. We, I still dominate this game. Magic was saying, you ain't the guy, and you got other players in this, in this gym. Doesn't take much. I love Magic, bro. I love the way he played, bro. He's so competitive and I fuck with it. Get Michael going. Just a little something to tweak him and it's on. Right. It don't take much for Michael to feel a certain way. Now he finna drop 50 on your head. He never liked to lose. Mike always got that look. When you see that look, then you know just get the damn ball and get out the way. Mm -hmm. As much as it was five on five, you could see in Monte Carlo that it was gravitating towards, okay, Michael and Magic. Magic was hesitant to surrender his place on the mountaintop. And Michael being Michael, he needed to say, no, I'm on the top of the mountain now. Now he's saying, look, NBA's not yours yet. You know, I'm still here. Michael's like, no, it's old. This is, this is mine. And the funny thing was Larry was, he was sitting on the side, he goes, it's his. <laughs> Chuck realized the competition aspect was getting a little bit too high. Killing everybody on our squad. He wanted to end practice, but Magic didn't want to end because he wanted to keep playing because we just kicked his ass. How you like that ass kicking we gave you? Oh, no, no, no. Come on now. Y'all got the first, first quarter of practice now. By the time practice was over, 
even Magic had to acknowledge. Basketball's landscape had been changed forever. Larry and I were talking, and Michael walks in, and he says, it's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> and we both hit each other like, well, he's not lying. <laughs> Monte Carlo was kind of a turning point. Walls started to come down from, you know, when you're playing against each other, you have these rivalries. These were my teammates now. They're guys that, you know, that I'm... Now they're making real relationships. And look, that nigga Michael got the sevens, boy, the Olympic sevens. Walls started look to come up. down from, you know, when you're playing against each other, you have these rivalries. These were my teammates now. They're guys that, you know, that I'm looking towards for support. It seemed like we became more friends than anything else. The players were off to Barcelona, headed to the Olympics, unmistakably as a team. States men's basketball team landed in Barcelona for the Olympics on July 24, 1992. In store was an experience unlike anything they or the sports world had ever seen. The plane landed in Barcelona, helicopters flying over it. We're thinking, wow, what is all the commotion? What happened? And then we figured out they were there for us. You have it. That was the first time did we realize how popular and how enormous this thing was? I was like, guys, if we lose, it's gonna be like the biggest upset in sports history. Barkley was right. There was no margin for error. A reality the rest of the team openly accepted in their first press conference in Spain. I know I'm really afraid to fail because I can't go back home if, if we don't win the gold. Even though from a little small place in Summerfield, those 250 people there said, we, I can't come back. Barkley, meanwhile, handled an endless barrage of questions as only he could. How did you feel in 1972 when the Soviet Union beat the United States in that wild game? Well, I had just flunked my entrance exam in the kindergarten, so I really, that was the only thing, you know. You know, everybody that has ever been in front of a camera, we tend to not say certain things. Why don't they just take their ass looking like people and go home? <laughs> Barkley says things that we would think about and never say. We're gonna have a li little revenge in our hearts for 72 and 88. David, he can't say that because he's a Christian, but uh... <laughs> He said, man, you don't talk honestly enough to the media. You need to tell them what you're really thinking. I said, Charles, you talk too much to the media. You need to stop telling them everything you're thinking. And when Charles was asked about the team's first opponent, his prediction was... At the end of the day, even though everybody got big egos, or even though everybody big in their own way, bro, these niggas is real genuine. They real people. And they created real relationships with each other, and I fuck with that. As honest as ever. I don't know anything about Angola, but Angola's in trouble, I think. Just moments ago, the Dream Team boarded the bus outside their hotel along the Rambles. They're heading for their first matchup in Barcelona with the Angolans. I can remember the first game, the real game, when we came out of the locker room and, and stepped on the court. And I finally said to myself, Holy shit. I can't believe this, I'm here. At that point, we were in serious Olympic mode. This actually may be the biggest Mismatch of the entire Olympics. Magic round. The US. Magic to Jordan is nasty. That's legendary to see, bro. Magic to Jordan. <laughs> It was just a tremendous atmosphere because there was an appreciation for how great the U.S. players were. After the first half, 
Barkley's pregame prediction appeared dead fuck? on. But in the second, Charles found some trouble. Hey, the players in Angola, we play against Charles Barkley. They told us there's no a, a, a kid, a fat boy, is a is many aggressive in the pain. I thought they were playing dirty, and, and I told the old boy, I don't, I don't even know if he understood my name, man, ease up on the elbow. He said, Barkley? <laughs> he said, I don't even think he, he understood me for real. He's up on the mailboys, elbows, boy. And, and I told the old boy, I don't, I don't even know if he understood my name, man, ease up on the elbow. Barkley? I let it go twice. You can see the frustration for the Barkley. And next time I just cracked it. Barkley from Pippen. And a technical foul is called To his dying day, Charles claims the guy elbowed him three times. I said, Charles, you know, you're full of crap. No, he's not true. I didn't uh, have a back to before the incident. got this nigga on the documentary I don't know like shit from the footage I seen I ain't seen no elbow let me see fam cause Charles Barkley might be tweaking and the next time I just crack Barkley okay let's go back I might have seen it I thought they were playing dirty and, and I told the old boy I don't, I don't even know if he understood my name man ease up on the elbow Barkley I don't know if you can see it, but it might have been an elbow to the waist right there. To the abdomen. Let me see. And, and I told the old boy, I don't, I don't even know if you understood my name, man. He Watch. ends up on the elbow. Charles coming down right here. Oh, damn. That shit go out quick. I let it go twice. He might have got hit in the elbow, fam. I mean, he might have got hit with the elbow. Charles, you know, you're full of crap. No, he's not true. God. I didn't uh, have a factor before the incident. Do you even remember for real, bro? Turn the other cheek. If you turn the other cheek, I'm going to get you another cheek, too. I thought, what are you doing, Charles? <laughs> the guy is half your size, but you know, Charles is an equal opportunity abuser. Erlanda Codepera did not think it was a, uh, a friendly elbow. That's the same guy just asked for an autograph, Charles. I mean, you think he's not intimidated? I think he's acting like a bully. But maybe it's, uh, it's from his personality. The United States has the and a score of 116 to 48. Damn! The game may have ended in a round, but afterwards, the result was overshadowed by the controversy. What's with the elbow? Well, he hit me, I hit him. That's the way it is. Charles made you look like the ugly Americans, which we were trying not to do. We said to Charles, look, man, you're a reflection of all of us. So if you do it, they're not going to write the article that Charles Barkley did. They're going to say the dream team. Right, Team USA. Barkley had stained a dream debut for the Americans. But in their next game against Croatia, Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan grabbed the spotlight with the focus on their matchup with one of Europe's best players. Tony Kukoc. Major storyline that carries into the I ain't never heard of Tony. Tony Kukoc, second round pick of the Chicago Bulls back in 1989. The Bulls made a strong push to sign him last season. At that time, general managers in the league were trying to come up with gems, you know, make their discoveries they overseas. For the Bulls in and Krauss thought this guy could play in the NBA. While Jordan and Pippen had been winning back to back titles, Chicago GM Jerry Krauss had been publicly wooing Kukoc to join the Bulls. Krause was recruiting this guy and talking about how great he was. You know, that's like a, a father who has all his kids and now he sees another kid that he loves more than he loves his own. So we were not playing against Tony Kukoc. We were playing against Jerry Krause. I could see them looking at it like that. But like, I don't know, I wouldn't have looked at it like In that. In a Croatian uniform. 
I'm still and finna cook your ass. For the real though. Tony Kukoc. Straight up. He was now the target of the world's two best defensive players. They was debating who was gonna guard him. No, 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 I got it. No, 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 I got it. I'm looking at Michael and Scotty, and they're ready for like blood. Like, man. We knew the world was gonna be watching. We knew everyone wanted to see what Tony Kukoc was like, and we were gonna give him the worst experience he ever had on the basketball court. Pippen drew the initial assignment of shadowing Kukoc. Oh, this nigga pressing full court, fam. Uh, something kind of told me he was going to do that shit. When the nigga for real, I'm talking about serious, serious on the court, they're going to press you full court. Watch. On the basketball court. He ain't playing. Pippen drew the initial assignment of shadowing Kukoc. He going to run the whole way with you. the Croatian from the opening whistle. <laughs> All right. It's hard to Look. run across the half court without a ball. Uh, and uh, with the ball, it was just, here, somebody else get it. Tony definitely wasn't getting a shot up, and he wasn't going to score. Kukoc did nothing for four, and he's contributed nothing. We wanted to go guard him on the bench. Kukoc is called for the offensive foul, and the pressure continues. And after Pippen wore Kukoc down, it was Jordan's turn. Ah. Kukoc. Stolen by Jordan, he reads the pass and everyone slams up. Them dudes were all over him. Yeah. Here's a three on two. <gasps> Scotty. Over him. Scotty, no way. Here's a three on two. Sight. Filthy. I had questions from my teammates during the game, but like, what is going on? What they, do you not see that they're really trying to uh, get you off the court? And I'm like, so what? I guess that's that's how NBA game is played. Pippen, Jordan, and the Americans cruise to another victory. This one by 38 points, but the domination had its detractors. This team of all stars is almost too good. Is it a positive or a negative? The question was now being asked, was the dream team too great for its own good? This team of all stars is almost too too great for its own good. Too good. Some think that we should go back to the collegians. It's been too easy. I think then we ought to ban the uh, African runners from the 10,000 meters because they make it look so easy as well. <laughs> this is about our best, and this is wonderful for the... What do you say? Too easy. I think then we ought to ban the uh, African runners from the 10,000 meters because they make it look so easy as well. <laughs> this is about our what best, do you mean by and this is wonderful for the sport of basketball. Irvin, uh, there's been some comments that the Dream Team is getting all the attention, and there seems to be some resentment about it. Have you heard about it, and do you have any feelings about it? Uh, Basically, you know, we haven't heard about it. We're just here to do our job. The media may have been looking for signs of a backlash, but in Barcelona and in the world beyond, the embrace of the Dream Team is universal. You got a root gonna stand out and root against Picasso? I mean, I mean, I'm seriously. They rooted for genius at work. I kept thinking that the attention would dissipate. They're gonna play the first game. They're gonna win by 60. People are going to go back and watch Trip. Jordan in transition with a slam to give Team USA a 60 point lead. It didn't. It kept building and building and building. The US with another trouncing 127 83. Workers were trying to get autographs. The security people were trying to get autographs. All the athletes were Tom standing Stock. outside like a parade. Mm. People perceived us as being superheroes. This was a The guy on the bench is taking pictures, and I said, "Wow, we are having an effect over here." Clap, clap. 
seems as if uh, the President of the United States was uh, in the midst of a, a caravan that was going through the streets. It was like the Beatles, where there's thousands and thousands of people waiting all the time. Bro, did you just see the headphones this nigga had on his head, fam? It was like the Beatles, where there's thousands and thousands of people waiting all the time. Fam, what are those? Nah, I gotta see. What are those, bro? Headphones in 1992, because this ain't right. Yeah, I remember those, but he ain't got them. Everybody remember these, right? Hell yeah. If you had a CD player, you had these. But what he got? Oh yeah, them must have been brand spanking new back then, because, boy, I ain't never seen them. That's about exhilarating 15 seconds a month. We're like, wow, this is amazing. No one member of the Dream Team reveled in the Olympic experience more than Charles Barkley. After throwing the controversial elbow against Angola, Barkley had emerged as the team's most visible player. Everybody always had the same question. How much of a, an ass is Charles Barkley? Hey Jack, when am I gonna be on the cover of Sports Illustrated for this stuff? I should be on the Dream Team cover. And then every time you'd go spend time with him, you know, you'd just realize that he was the most enjoyable act not only in all of sports, but possibly in all of pop culture. Sometimes I dream <laughs> that he is me. How can I want to be like Chuck? I mean, Mike. Right away, I told my editors, I said, well, the number one angle here is what is Charles doing? And if you wanted the answer to that question, all you had to do was follow the crowds. They're like, we don't want you guys out and about because we don't know how safe it is. And I'm like, dude, I'm at the Olympics. I'm not gonna stay in my room the whole time. So Barkley strolled Los Ramos, a man of the people, if ever there was one. Man, I walked up and down the Ramos every night, and the people were fantastic. They all wanted autographs and wanted to take pictures. We could be inside the hotel. Soon we heard the big roar. <sighs> we said, there go Charles. <laughs> Charles outside. <laughs> So Charles would be walking, and then thousands would be following him everywhere he went, you know. He was the Pied Piper. Charles would go over to the village and, like, find the Angolan players and hang out along the Ramos at night. He was the most memorable person of the 1992 Olympics. I just saw this touch he had. I don't think anybody else in the world could have done it besides Charles Barkley. At the end of the day, he was America's best ambassador. Barkley was celebrated for experiencing the Olympics on his own terms. More quietly, one of his teammates found a way to do the same. We had the motorcycle escorts and we bust through traffic like Dick Tracy. But this one day, we got stuck in traffic. We're just sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. Finally, I said, that's it. Let's go. Anybody wants to go with me, I'm in. He'd get off the bus, and his family met him. He started walking right through the middle of everybody, and nobody noticed him. I'm still on the bus, seeing him walk down the street, and I'm saying to myself, I would give anything to do what he just did. See, so guys, this is called the wrong bus. See all the footprints? All right. Or Las Rambas, it's like Times Square or something. There's just so many people walking. Six feet one, I'm about the average size of everybody else on that little walk. So I'm walking with my family and I have the camera and nobody's noticing. I think it's the sunglasses that's full. Yeah. Must be. Hi, you're from America. Yeah. Whereabouts? Yeah. Whereabouts? Yeah. Massachusetts. Massachusetts. You've been watching the Dream Team at all? Yeah. They're pretty good, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. No attention whatsoever. Finally, we ran across this lady who had the dream team and all the pictures on her T-shirt. Hi. Hi. Are you an American? Of course. You look wonderful. Why, thank you. She started speaking real excitedly about each of the players. 
And I said, have you had a chance to meet anyone? He's a hell of a player. See, you got all the players right there in your shirt. Is Charles the only one you've ever seen? Hey, guys, do you know any of those guys on there? I think my oldest son, Houston, ruined the surprise. That's your dad? Too bad he's not here. I do, yeah. I can't go anywhere without being bugged. Really? Damn. She said... She still didn't know, bro. Which, in his, in his perspective, he probably would want more recognition. But, like Carl said, like some of them would wish to just be, like be able to get off and like not be noticed. So I can see. Really, not much different from Michael Jordan walking through here. <laughs> For the players, surreal experiences. That boy full of sarcasm, more, ain't he? But even more memorable with the unlikely friendships developing behind the curtain. It was a unique mix. You know, Larry Bird and Patrick Ewing became like best friends. I got a white guy from Indiana, and I got a brother from Jamaica. Patrick said I could pick his mind. It took me three minutes. I get a chance to come back and start picking on mine. It took me one. <laughs> We were probably the two of the most unlikely people you thought that would be friends. But if you look, not only Larry and I got to be great friends, but all of those guys got to be much better friends. We all enjoyed each other. We all enjoyed the ride. And we got a sense of each other as men. Then when we got to the court, it made it even better. The Dream Team's chemistry turned out to be the hallmark of their success as the players closed in on what they came for. Their big margins of victory may have been a testament to their dominance, but numbers couldn't capture what made watching them so unforgettable. Guys played the best basketball you've ever seen in your life. It was literally like great poetry and great art. At times, you feel you're watching a performance, a concert, rather than a basketball competition. This was fun. This was like, it's how basketball supposed to be. And at the center of the fun was the team's biggest star, who had come to Barcelona at the peak of his powers and shown how much his popularity had exploded. I will say this one thing about Michael Jordan. I've been around other celebrities in my life, I've never seen people react like they do to him. People go crazy when they see him. <laughs> she went crazy, fam. In every corner of the world, there was someone who just wanted to see him. Please, Michael Jordan! No one had the sort of pull, the gravity that Michael Jordan had. Jordan had initially come to Barcelona reluctantly, but an early morning trip just before the gold medal game revealed how meaningful his Olympic experience had become. What time in the morning is it right now? 6.30, 6 quarter, quarter seven, something like that. Don't drink the coffee. We've got to be a hurry. Can we go now? Where are you from? Albuquerque. Albuquerque, New Mexico. Big failures. Everyone's big failures. Your name? George Hirsch. George, how you doing? I'm George. Michael George. Nice to meet you. Last night, I hit my wall. Did you? I couldn't make a basket. What are you doing up so early? I do remember getting up early <laughs> to walk into the stadium. That is the thing that I remember the most about the Olympics. Olympic Stadium. Imagine all the athletes that's been here before us. It's amazing. Somebody ever poses 122 consecutive races. I think everybody's got something to church. I think this is something that my kids are going to love one day. The Dream Team squared off against Croatia again in the gold medal game, offering the world one more lasting impression of their supremacy. On the pass. Pass.
Team USA came to send a message tonight. We wanted to win and we wanted to dominate, but how we did it, sharing the ball, including everybody, we did it as a true team. The U.S. has defeated Croatia 117 to 85, and they have won the gold here in Barcelona. There was never really any doubt the Dream Team would win gold in 1992. But as they walked back onto the court to get their medals, the moment still overwhelmed them. We saw a lot of tears from players. It was a very proud moment for me because anytime you represent your country, you know, that's a prideful thing. Send chills down my spine. It was a reward that I had never felt like that I would ever achieve. To do it on that stage with those group of guys, it's a memory I'll never forget. Nothing in my life has ever felt like standing on that podium. I was getting goosebumps. Every single time I heard the national anthem after that had a different significance to me. I'm already knowing knew what it really meant, you know. As a young kid growing up, I used to watch Olympics on TV with my father, and uh, all he talked about was the Star Spangled Banner and the gold medal. It made him feel proud to be American. Being up on that podium that night and receiving it, my father, he'd been pretty proud. All those emotions just overcame me. I got to be one of the guys one more time for my country. I said, man, I'll never forget this moment. You know, if this is the end, this is how I wanted to go out. This group that will be the greatest team ever assembled in the history of team sports. But when the medal ceremony was over, another realization began to settle in. When I walked off, I remember thinking that whole uh, dream has come to an end. The next season, every Olympian except Magic Johnson and Larry Bird would return to the NBA. Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen would win their third title against Charles Barkley and the Phoenix Suns on the way to six championships overall. The last three with Tony Kukoc. That's crazy. Eventually, other members of the team would also win titles. But each NBA player on the Dream Team would reach the Hall of Fame. Still, it's what they did together that summer. Legendary. That had the biggest impact on the game. An impact that continues to grow today. It really lifted basketball and it gave birth to international stars who had nothing to do with those games in 92, but who took so much from it. We made the game a worldwide game. You know, I talked to Tony Parker. I talked to Ginobili. Hell yeah. I talked to Dirk Nowitzki. Those guys say their first love of basketball started with the Dream Team. And I'm really proud of that. That's lit. The world Nigga, can change a lot. To be the inspiration to, to some greats? Yeah, bro. Psh, what? Started with the Dream Team. And I'm really proud of that. Hell yeah, gotta be. The world can change a lot in 20 years. But there are moments in time you never forget, no matter how long it's been, no matter how much else has changed in your life since. 20 years later, they've all kept ties to the game in one way or another. And they all talk about the summer of 92, as if it happened just yesterday. 
an experience still unlike any other in their remarkable basketball lives. I've never had more fun being around anybody. Everybody got along, there was no ego, we had fun. You know, clearly everybody reminds me I never won a championship. So that to me was like winning the championship, winning the gold medal and hanging out with these guys. The reward itself is really only a small part of the story. It's what the gold medal represents that will always tie these men together. This is like this fraternity. It's, that's pretty awesome. I don't think you're ever going to be able to get 11 Hall of Famers to play all at once, you know, um, on one team. That's that's how they're going. <sighs> we go on the bus. <sighs> Come back. <sighs> Walk out the hotel. <sighs> Wave. <sighs> Wave outside your window. <sighs> I can't believe it. It changed sport as we know it. They showed the world how to play basketball. What other team can say that? I don't think we'll ever see anything like it again. It's an insult to compare anybody else to that team. Take a good look. Perhaps we'll never see a team this great again. Hasn't had that happen, and uh, that's the dream State basketball, dream team, original, NBA. That's lit, bro. The dream team documentary part two, bro. Ain't gonna lie, y'all was right. This one coming off of the rivalship. Yeah, bro. These bitches have been impactful. And it has shown way deeper than basketball. And to see everybody, like, who they are off the court, like, that's, like, that shit was magical, bro. I fuck with the footage, bro. I fuck with the footage. Like, I definitely have respect, way more respect for some of those guys than I had before I watched it, you know? I don't know these people at all. So, like, to see footage of them off the court, like, because that's, that's going to matter at the end of the day, you know what I'm saying? I fuck with it. I fuck with it. I give it a 20, bro. This video is crazy. This documentary is insane. Bonkers. Let me know in the comments what y'all thought about the video in the reaction. If y'all have another documentary or some sort, let me know in the comments, bro. Let me know in the comments. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe. Hit that share. And you know what it is. OTBL. Out of there.